Okay, so again, this little exercise is to take our web API as the data source, right? And then we're going to make a client as a universal Windows app. So I'll just start off the usual file new project here. And I will make it, I'll do my usual approach, just making a folder off the root of the C drive. And I'll call the project, one sec. So I'll call the project Universal Windows App Company Client, okay? So we'll just go ahead and, oh, <laughs> business intelligence. No, that wouldn't be very intelligent of me, would it? Okay, Windows blank Universal App, there we go. Whew. Woo, that was a close one. I almost picked the wrong project stop. Who wants application intelligence or whatever that was? Ugh. Maybe someday, but not today. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, that's good. And, of course, my nag will come up in a moment. There you go. Web Essentials nagging us again. All right, go away. Okay, so what we have is our standard template here. The uh, file opened is the code behind file for the application object itself. Uh, maybe something to talk about first of all is the fact that uh, uh, this kind of development, typically as a professional, you'll be using some sort of a design paradigm, whether it's a uh, model view view model which you may have heard of before. It's a, a slightly different approach from the model view controller we focused on last term. Uh, more geared towards somewhat of a smarter client, right? The, the view model approach. So it's a similar idea. By the way, with NuGet, you can very quickly add a number of frameworks for doing MVVM, you know, right into your project and away you go. I'm not gonna do that today because as soon as you start using these uh, frameworks, sometimes it obscures so much Right? It just, it's kind of like using a game engine to do all your game development. Right? As a developer, it might be fast and easy, but if push comes to shove, you really don't necessarily know everything about the actual programming that's involved in making your game work. Right? So same idea. I want to keep it simple and clear, and for an easy transition of learning new concepts, this approach will be similar to the kind of coding you've done before. Right? So you'll easily grasp onto this. It's an easy migration. And so we won't complicate it by obscuring everything into uh, something like that just yet. Now, one of the things that often comes up then is where do you put pieces of information that you might need throughout the application? So the poor man's choice here, hey, I said the key word, application. The application is there, he's always there, right? In fact, this app object we see the code open for is a great little spot to put information that we can just access from anywhere. You know, I know that in the past, you know, probably from your first programming courses, you were told global variables are a sin, right? And there's some truth to that because they can make uh, debugging and, you know, tracking down certain types of errors a real nightmare because it could be modified anywhere in the application if it's globally available to be modified throughout an application. But that's not really what we're going to be doing here anyway. So we're, we're safe in this approach. It's not really a sin to do what I'm about to do. What we're going to do is I'm going to use the app, the application object. Oh, before I get too far, far let me just go into my options, set my favorite uh, display thing here, my all languages, text editor, word wrap. That way I can make the font big and still see the whole command line on the screen, right? Okay. So we have our uh, sealed partial class app, the application object itself. Uh, there's a constructor for it and so on. The reason why I'm using it is uh, I can access properties from this. I don't even have to instantiate it, right? It's just there. And I can pull properties out of it that are static and just use them as a global reference, so to speak. I can't get into trouble from a debug point of view because it's a static, right? I'm not going to be able to change it anyway in this case. So it's a good spot to put one of the pieces of information we'll need to know no matter what and where we are in the program. At some point, we're going to need to know where's that darn web API? Right, so I'll throw a line of code in here. Okay, public static. It's a URI. 
right? That's the type, that's an actual type in C-sharp. DBURI, I'll call it. And I'll just create it as our path to my Azure website that I put up last week, right? Might as well use that, just keep this simple. By the way, if, if I wanted to go back and forth between running a local one, I would probably just put two copies of this line with the other address and comment at one at a time. Let me easily switch between a local web API and one on the internet. But that'll do for now. So it's in a nice local, sorry, centralized place here that I'll be able to get it from anywhere. Because while I'm in here, one of the other things that uh, he talks about in our textbook tutorial is this little bit of code here. This is the one that, especially on a mobile device, gives you that really annoying frame counter thing covering up part of the screen, right? So I typically will comment this out. If I ever need, I'm worried about the frame counter and seeing, you know, how, uh, how fast my game loop is running on my little game, <laughs> then I'll uncomment the code. So for now, though, I just find that irritating. So that's the other change I'm going to do here. So that's it from our, our .cs, the code behind for the app object itself, right? I'll just save and close that. All right, so this is going to be a client for actual data. Now we'll start off in our first iteration here, just reading data and displaying it, right? Part two will be when we actually get the full CRUD operation in place. But to start nice and simple and easy, uh, I still am going to need to understand what the various entity objects are that I'm working with. So that involves models. So first thing I might do, because it doesn't have the whole structure here, is I'll make a few folders to help me organize models and DAL, because I like to have my data access layer contained in one sort of namespace as well, right? So I'll just right click here, we'll just quickly add just a plain old folder, I'll call it models, similar to how we did in MVC and so on. And I'll do another one for my data access layer. Okay, now I did show you last week, right? I can go to my web API grab the JSON, right, and then use the built-in paste as JSON tool to actually create the class locally. The only thing I don't get from that is my summary properties, the actual formula there. But you know what? It's often pretty easy to figure out if you know what you're doing. Otherwise, it would just assume that it's going to be a, <coughs> a getter and a setter and everything else, right? However, I am the programmer. I do have those classes, so why make it hard on myself, right? Why don't I just utilize them and away we go. So I'll just come to models. So for my company, I have two classes, department and employee. And employee. Okay. And, you know, making them public, of course, but the exact same classes that I've used uh, on the web API can work here, right? I don't have to worry too much about annotations, with one exception. I'm going to include an extra annotation in here simply because it makes sense down the road. Uh, to get at that, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. Let me just uh, I'll grab my department class and just paste it in. We'll come back in a second. I'll just get the other one as well. And there's two main issues I want to talk about before we go on, just to make sure that we all have a, a good understanding of the two issues involved here. So for employee as well. Okay. Now, of course, there's lots of red squigglies, right? Because I'm missing some usings. There's my usual uh, system component model data annotations, right? Namespace I need. But there's one more that I'm going to have to add. It'll go to a red underline in a second here. And I'll talk about this in a moment. Notice that is, let me just zoom, system runtime serialization. I don't need these annotations for anything we're going to do throughout even part two, right? What these are for, part of the serialization uh, capabilities built into .NET is the ability to serialize any object out into virtually any kind of a, a standard like XML, JSON, there's a few other formats you can do as well. You can write your own custom serializers and inherit and then set them up in addition, right? So the idea is to take an object and dematerialize it, right? Into something that's easily stored in just a text file. 
So, you know, last year, remember we had our model binder, the default one in MVC that we could just pass the name value pairs in a, say, for example, a post, so HTTP post, and it would materialize an actual object, patient, doctor, whatever, right? Well, serialization is really just the reverse process. It's taking an object and describing it in a text file, right? And that's what JSON really is. So why are we gonna bother with this? Well, these annotations, in particular the one at the top, the class gets the annotation data contract, and each member of the class that we would want to persist out gets annotated as a data member, okay? We would add those annotations because it helps improve performance in the serialization process. Why would we ever want to serialize this? Well, think about it. This will eventually be running probably on a mobile device. What happens to your application when a phone call comes in? You're probably going to answer the phone, right? So your application is going to somehow go into the background. And if it's a long conversation, at some point it will be, depending on the platform, they'll use terms like uh, tombstoned, perhaps, or suspended, right? So it'll actually have to get uh, put into a hibernation state, you might say. And eventually it might have even just close if the system needs memory. It'll just actually even close the application to make room for other processes that are required. So if you're in the middle of doing something, right, you want it to be able to remember where I left off, right? That's pretty important to the end user. You want, if you're in the middle of something, they want to be able to come back and pick up where they left off. So that's where serialization would come into play is you might eventually, and there's spots where you just throw in some code to take the current status of whatever collections are currently in memory, these collections of objects, and part of the hibernation or tombstone process might be to write them out into the local memory of the phone, right? So down the road, this becomes important. We aren't gonna be serializing our objects at this stage, but I wanted to explain before I threw this in, it's good practice to throw these annotations in, so I wanted to explain why they're there. I hate just throwing code in and not telling you why I'm putting it there. Fair enough? Okay, all right, so that's why we have that. Now, uh, just going, oh, before I leave department, anybody notice something missing? I know we talked about this last week, but it's a good review point. The thing at the bottom, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that eye collection, right? Or, or list or whatever you want, some sort of a collection of the child objects, okay? Can anyone tell me why, again, we are leaving that out? Yeah, everyone around the room drawing circles in the air, that's right. The circular reference that you know, when you try to serialize one of these with a collection of uh, employees, and of course each employee has a department, and then of course that department will want it. Anyway, yeah, so you get that circular reference. It was always a luxury to have that eye collection in here. We didn't even need it unless we wanted to actually include the child and do things like on a details view, show all the related children, right? So all the patients for a given doctor, things like that. Uh, that's a luxury and there's other ways to get that information if you really really need it we'll just create a data transfer object or a view model populate it instead but our actual model objects that are going to be used to materialize the actual JSON data downloaded okay we can't have that in there or it'll just cause confusion okay good good two points so in the employee once again I got to add my two usings here one for the serialization and one for my regular annotations as well. Oop, control period, data annotations. Okay, one thing I might point out, notice that my, quote, summary properties don't have the annotation for data member. That makes sense, because they don't store anything, right? So there's no data being stored in, say, the full name. It's just a combination of properties of elsewhere in the class. So when you go to serialize this class, as a data contract, you wouldn't store anything extra for those summary properties. So that makes sense that they wouldn't have the annotation. Okay, other than that, this is pretty boilerplate stuff, pretty much as we've done it in the past, right? Okay, so that's good. Now we know what our classes are and what they look like. So I'll just get rid of that. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Now coming to the data access layer, I'm going to add some classes here as well. Um, course we don't actually have to talk to a database here right don't have to worry about migrations or anything because hey this is a client the data is already being managed for us in a web API in this case but in general for many client applications 
By the way, the repository design pattern is already built into MVC, so we don't have to worry about it there. And MVC project uh, entity framework follows that design pattern. But when we're building our own, it's a very, very good practice to use what is called the repository design pattern. I know it's not the first time I've talked about it, and you've probably dealt with it in other classes as well. The idea is, what is a repository, right? It's like a bank. It's where you store stuff, right? Hopefully money <laughs> in the bank, right? You go into the teller, well, she's the interface, okay? You say, give me some money out of my account or deposit this into my savings or my checking or whatever, right? Uh, update my balance, okay? Those are all things that you do through that teller, the interface, but how, what they're doing with your money in the back end, do you really know, right? Maybe they've got it invested in somebody else's mortgage or maybe it's in stocks and bonds, you know? The idea is that if you have confidence in the bank, you don't have to know exactly what's happening behind the interface. As long as you can go to the teller, get the money you want when you want it, deposit, do whatever else you have to do, you're happy. Well, a repository is very much like that, only for data instead of money. Okay? Although you can make money with this kind of approach. <laughs> oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Okay? Uh, yes, as, as graduates, you're going to make lots of money, I promise. Okay, all right. Uh, so. Our, our repository for data, right? We don't have to care how it's actually storing the data. We just know that if I come to the uh, interface and say, give me a whole list of employees, or maybe just the employees for a given department, or add this new department, or update it, or whatever, right? That all of those operations are available. So, very good practice is to design the actual interface whenever you're going to implement your own repository pattern, right? If you define an interface, these are all the capabilities that I expect the interface to be able to do. Then afterwards, as long as whatever repository is created, as long as it fully implements your interface, you're golden, right? You don't have to worry about how the repository does it. And later on, it's easy to woof, woof, switch out that repository for a different one altogether. So instead of using a web API, it could be saving it in a SQLite database, right? Right on the uh, device or whatever. You don't have to care how the money is being managed in the background. As long as the interface is consistent, you don't have to worry about breaking any of the functionality in the front end of the application. So again, not always necessary, but a good practice to create an interface first, right? So I'll make a couple of interfaces, one for each entity here. So I stands for interface, and you've used them before, like I validatable object for one you've done with me, right? I department repository. Try to spell it right today, might help. Okay. All right. So, but it's not a class, okay? It's not an actual class, it's an uh, interface. So I'll make it public for one thing. And it's an interface, INT, there you go. IntelliSense is helping me out, okay? So I'm going to define this interface. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm saying these are all the things that I need it to be able to do. I have to be able to go up to the teller and ask for this, right? So I'll just paste my code in here. So I have a bunch of tasks that I need the interface to be able to do, right? Like get all the departments, okay? Or get one department by identifying the primary key for that one department, right? Add to a department update a department, delete a department. Those are the standard operations that we usually go for. Remember way back in Prague 1198, I stood up in the front of the room and preached to you about the five standard stored procedures. <laughs> You're probably sick of hearing me mention that back then. Anyway, here's the same idea, right? Get, give me all of them, give me one by the primary key, add, update, and delete. So it's exactly the same five operations here do my control period to add the namespace for the models folder so it understands the department. Okay, so those are the tasks. Now, that task keyword, that is because I'm anticipating all communication across the internet really should be done asynchronously, right? You've done asynchronous programming before now, and it's definitely the way to go. <laughs> asynchronous, you know, you don't want your application to lock up or say not responding just because you're waiting for a response back, right? So that's why we're using tasks, because they work very well for asynchronous programming. So let me just get my other one here. I'll just add again another class for I employee.
repository. Okay, and to save a snippet of time, I'll just replace the whole chunk of code here at once. Okay, again, I'll have some red squigglies for the model namespace. Now, I threw in one extra one here, right? I threw in an extra, there's six tasks available through this interface. One is to get employees by department. Very common thing though, right? Whenever you have a foreign key, very common to add the ability in the application to filter and give me all the employees in the department, that type of thing. Whenever you have a foreign key, just assume that somebody's gonna wanna filter by it, right? So there we go. So that's basically it for my repository. So that's good, I'll just save those. And it never hurts to do a build every once in a while. See how many build errors I have. And so far, I'm hoping not too many. Okay, good. Now, we're ready to actually do some work, right? So I've defined the interface. This is what I need the repository to do for me. How it goes about it is its problem, but of course, I'm also <laughs> responsible for building that. So let's see about how the interface can help us get started at the very least. So I'll add the next class, which will be the actual department repository. Okay. So once again, first thing is I'll just make it public. All right. So how do I guarantee that this class will follow the rules that I've defined? Well, essentially, I department repository, right? Oh, of course it's saying, hang on, okay, there's a problem. I'm gonna click the light bulb, and you see there, it's saying, well, we can fix the problem in a couple of ways. First one is obviously implement the interface. There we go. So you can see right away, part of the value of having interfaces, right? So now it's come to this class that I says it needs to fully implement this interface, and it's created all of those tasks, right? Now they need to be programmed. They all just say throw <laughs> not implemented exception, right? It doesn't do all the work for me. They, you know, you got to do something to earn your big salary, right, as a programmer. Uh, but you know, the structure is here, right? As long as I f fulfill all these, I'm good to go. Obviously, I need to modify them a little bit for asynchronous and things like that, and figure out how I'm actually going to do each and every one of these. Well, that's where the code that we did in our console app last week, and that you're working on in the lab will come into play, right? Uh, by the way, just to show you, if I took one of these and even just deleted it, wouldn't be very long before the IntelliSense see the red line showed up again under the interface. It was telling me, hey, your class does not do the job. It is not fully implementing the interface, right? Because you're missing a task now, okay? Just want to point out that it's not just a one-time thing, but it actually does keep track and make sure that you have everything in place in the class to fully implement the interface you've defined that it should. Okay, all right. Uh, I can just undo to at least get rid of that error for now. Now let's just talk a little bit about some differences in how I would write this code from how you did it in the tutorial and you're working on in your lab. Uh, he makes the point there that, uh, and I have to be honest with you, this is different from how I did it last year. Last year, each and every one of these tasks, I would create an HTTP client object with a using, right? Using is actually a very good way to do it. There's nothing wrong with that approach because it guarantees that the garbage collector cleans it up. But I guess in some situations, that same code, if it was running on certain types of environments, uh, you can run it, there's a, time delay in freeing up sockets, web sockets and so on. So he encouraged you to create in any application that stays in memory, create a single HTTP client object. Okay, that was mentioned in the notes of the tutorial. So I'm gonna follow that approach this time and it works very, very well as well, right? Not that the other is wrong, but this is maybe in general terms, a safer approach to avoid that issue. So the first thing I'd wanna do is actually add my client, right? Oh, I just thought of something I've forgotten about altogether. I never even ran my NuGet package. <laughs> I haven't added the plumbing into this project for the HTTP client, right? So I'm definitely going to get red underlines. And even if I come over here to the light bulb, oh gosh. 
Is it so good that it doesn't even need me? <sighs> Visual Studio. They just keep ahead. You know what? Just to be safe and make sure that I don't run into problems, I'm just going to quickly go on and install that package. So just bring up the package manager console. It might need an update anyway. This will guarantee I have the most up-to-date stable version. Oops, sorry, go away. Right. So this line is right out of the tutorial. Right. Just install package for Microsoft ASP.NET Web API client. Right. So there we go. So now I know that it is successfully installed okay, and updated it if there was any need to update from the code that I already had, obviously, in the class. All right. Okay. So now we definitely know what a client is and away we go. Okay. Now the other thing is, because I'm going to reuse this one client object for all of my different uh, tasks, right? I need to set it up. So the best place to do that probably would be in a constructor, right? And we know how to make a constructor for a class. I just say public in the name of the class, a couple brackets if I need to pass parameters, and away we go. So department repository, couple brackets, couple squeals, and away we go. So there's our constructor. Uh, now, of course, for the constructor, um, there's a couple things to do. Right, and here's where I'm going to actually use some of the smarts that I put into my app object as well. Right, so I'll actually start off with that. Okay, the client, the base address of my HTTP client needs to know where to go and make its requests. Right, well, I've stored that in my app object. That's the beauty again, I don't have to instantiate a whole new app object, it's already hanging around, just sipping tea in the corner. Waiting, waiting for me to ask you to do some work. So there we go. All right, so the, obviously the other lines are the ones straight out of the tutorial, just to make sure that we're clear and ready to go and that we specifically, specifically are asking for JSON, right? I need a using just for this media type stuff. So light bulb, please, using system net HTTP headers. So I will just make sure that I actually in the header for all requests, I'm specifying JSON as the payload. Okay, that'll go away in a second. All right, unless I actually messed up something completely, but I don't think so. Okay, so then we're coming down here to the actual actions. Uh, I will actually take a moment and I'm going to copy paste. Obviously, I have put async in front of any of these, right? <clears throat> but I will grab my code and put it in place and we'll just talk about it. So for each of these tasks, I'm going to do the exact same kind of code we wrote in our tutorial. And you could improve upon this. This is not perfect code, okay? I'm just keeping it simple for now. So for get apartments, okay, right, again, I have to add async in order to actually use commands requiring async, asynchronous operation, right? But basically, I just call get async, passing API slash, I want departments, right, in this case. Okay. Now, I could use the try-catch approach, or you can just use an if and check for a success status code. Try-catch has the advantage that, you know, if you don't even have communication, right, then it'll, it'll actually handle that, give you a chance to do something in the catch. Normally, most of the code just says throw, Right, so it just passes it on anyway, which doesn't really <laughs> prevent it from crashing. So, you know, you could argue that this is every bit as valid, unless you're going to go to the work of actually trying to write something in the catch block to communicate in some way. Uh, sorry, we didn't get a success status code. This is what we got, and you know, don't panic. I'm going to handle it, and so on. Right, but if you're just going to throw it anyway, you might as well just do this. So as long as we have success. Right, then I will just materialize my list of department objects. Okay? And that is as easy using the .NET client as saying read as async. And it will just look and see, what do we got? Do I have JSON? Do I have XML? Do I have something else? As long as it can understand it, it will just materialize those objects. Bada bing. Right? And then it will return it. My else here, just because I promised I would return a list of department objects, I'll just return an empty list if I don't have a success status code. So you can improve upon this approach, but it's basic. It'll get the job done for now. And as long as you understand where it could be improved, that's the important thing. 
So getting a single department, okay, we just pass in the department ID, and then that gets built into the URI that we're passing for a get async, okay, just by passing it in here as the route parameter, the ID, right? And so our API slash departments should know exactly what to do with that to filter by it for the department ID. So that the code is the same, except for, of course, we aren't developing a list of department objects, it's a single department, and away we go. Now the other ones are even easier, right? Just basically uh, add, update, and delete is just our post, put, and delete, right? Uh, just threw in the ensure status code so that we do actually crash. <laughs> We'd actually raise an error if we don't get a status code. Since I wasn't going to handle it in any elegant way anyway, I might as well just let it pass the error on and I'll have to deal with it then. So that's the simplest way to write a repository like this. Okay, so that's really all there is. So just, we're setting up the one client to use throughout all the different tasks. Setting up in the constructor so it knows who to talk to and how to ask for things. And then basically just get this, get that, do this, do that. Same thing for now for our employee repository with one extra method. And to save a little bit of time, I will do my copy-paste magic. Just hoping I have the right number of curly braces. So far, so good. All right, now a couple of usings to have to add here, right? Using for the actual HTTP for my models. So it understands what an employee and department are. And sure enough, there's this one for the headers. And I think that's good. That should be all of them. So it's all the exact same code, right? Uh, we're creating a single client object for doing all of our work, communicating our telephone to the web API in this case, right? Uh, building up the uh, repository, setting its settings. So it's asking for JSON knows where to go and talk. And then now uh, we're just, of course, asking for employees instead. So the one different one here, get employees by department, right? So we pass in the department ID, okay? And then here, so notice that we don't write it, right, in quite the same fashion. We aren't just using route because it's not the default route would look for an actual employee ID. So I have to do it here as a query string parameter, right, with a question mark, name value pair, department ID equals the parameter being passed in, right? If you weren't sure how to write that, all you have to do is go to the web API. The built-in help in the system shows you how to do every request that's been defined in the API itself. So you can just take that code there and know exactly how to put this together. That's it. And then that should be our repositories. Okay, everything else, of course, notice the difference. If I just say get employee, right, when I pass the ID, it's just the uh, routed ID value because it's talking about an employee ID as opposed to a department ID. And that'll just return one employee. This is still getting a list of employees. It's just filtered by department. So that's just a quick example then of implementing a repository design pattern, defining the interfaces ahead of time, and then later on, if we want to change the code in the actual repositories, as long as they implement the interface, nothing in the actual front end would ever have to change, right? And it would just look after everything. So that's good. We'll just do a quick build, make sure we're on the right track. All right, so we have our plumbing in place, and we have our URI defined. Now we're ready to start working on the main page. So this part one example is just a simple display of the data, right? So let me just get, I can even close all this to declutter the screen a little. I'm all into decluttering these days. My wife is so good, right? See, we're, we're looking at probably listing our house for sale. So if you've ever been to that, you want to declutter, right? So it shows well, and then people will pay you $100,000 more than it's worth because it just looks so pretty, right? Okay, so I'm decluttering at home. We might as well declutter our code. All right. 
So let's come to our main page. I can just use it. It's here already. It does the job. So coming down here, main page, I'll just open it in the designer. And of course, I'll have to do some work in the code behind as well. You know me, I prefer to arrange it with a vertical split. I can just keep the little phone designer off to the side and see more of the code. All right. So by working through the tutorial, you saw in lessons 14 through 16, he talked all about the namespaces and so on. I'm guessing, but I think it was around those lessons. <laughs> see, I'm trying to pretend I'm smart. <coughs> okay. Uh, and he talks about the namespaces and so on, right? So, you know, here's the using for the actual company, for the project itself. But I want to, in my binding expressions, be able to use, he talks about the difference between binding and X binding. X binding is basically design time binding. And so you actually get IntelliSense to help you with your expressions. And type checking and all that stuff happens right at design time. You don't have to wait till later to get the error messages at runtime, right? Plus, X binding is faster because it can pre-compile and be ready. So X binding is the way to go, but of course you have to say, hey, this is the model I'm working with. It has to understand the actual classes in order to do this X binding approach. So first thing I might do is add a namespace here uh, to the uh, <coughs> namespaces up top. Anywhere in here, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll just stick it right here before the last one. Okay, so XML namespace, I'll call it data. This made sense to me. All the tutorials use that name because it does make sense. I could call it Fred, right? It's just a namespace name. It doesn't really matter, right? But it, of course, refers to our using for our models folder, which is the namespace containing our definition classes for, in my case, uh, department and employee, right? So I'm adding that line of code just so I can later on use a uh, more specific type of binding expressions that, under, that expect you to understand what the models are. Okay, so I have a grid. I can leave the basic grid in place. Uh, I don't mind grids as much as our uh, online tutorial teacher. Okay, so I'm going to just add a couple of row definitions first of all. all right, just <clears throat> one at the top, auto height. So it'll just take on whatever height is necessary to hold the content I stick in there. And the other one is give me everything else, right? Simple as that. So in the very top, I'm going to throw just some basic, some title stuff for the application itself. So I'll throw in a stack panel here. Okay. So this stack panel, right? Notice I specify grid row zero. You know by now, I didn't have to do that, right? Everything, if you don't specify, goes into zero row, zero column, right? And away you go. Uh, I just put it in there for clarity because we are just learning and just want to see it exactly where it is. A bit of margin work, a couple text boxes, just to give a nice looking title at the top of the page, company application, employee list, right? For now, we're just going to focus on the employees. Eventually, I'll be able to add, edit, and delete employees as well as see them, right? But at this stage, we're just going to see the employees and maybe filter them by a given department. That's all we're going to do for part one. So that gives me a little header at the top of the page. Now, that's in grid row zero. So grid row one is my star height, everything else. Well, I'm going to put another grid in there. So it'll be a child grid inside that main grid. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hang on one sec. Okay. So this grid, okay. Uh, it has a name, content panel, because I might refer to it in code. It goes in grid row one. I do require that designation now because it's not going in the default of zero. Okay, I'm just throwing a bit of margin on the left and right because I like to keep these things away from the edges of the screen a little bit. And I'm defining the same basic definition. So just remember, though, that this grid is a child grid inside one cell of the main grid, right? Simple as that. Uh, I have an auto height row at the top and then a star size for everything else. Okay, now the next thing I would put in to here is a stack panel. Okay, This stack panel will go in the grid row zero. Just remember this is of the child grid that's sitting in one cell of the main grid. So in the top row, the auto size one. And it just has a text block to say employees by department. Okay, And right beside it, 
this stack uh, stack panel. Uh, sorry, actually below it, but it will be a combo box. I love this combo box. It is such an improvement over the drop-down whisk control we had when we were just doing the phone applications. Right, the new universal window brought the combo box back, and it's much nicer to program. Okay, a couple key properties I'll point out. Of course, we have to use a name, right? Uh, because I'm going to be modifying its data source in code, right? Essentially, uh, the horizontal and vertical alignment is just stretched. I might as well let it fill the area that's there. This is a key property here, okay? Display member path. You guys, you're experienced, right? You've used various forms of drop-down lists, combo boxes in the past. The, there's always two things to think about with any of these list controls. There's one piece of information that is usually stored as the internal value, right? We might have slightly different names for different controls, but that's the idea. And the other piece of information is what is actually displayed, display text or something like that. So guess which this is? <laughs> display member path. Well, that's showing the path within the design of the object itself, which property is going to be displayed, right? So I'm defining that here as DEPT name. Look familiar? That's just our actual property of the department object where the name of the department sits, right? So that's going to be what we display as the visible text inside the combo box, the drop down itself. Okay. An event handler for the selection changed event. Another really nice uh, improvement. They've been refining this with the universal Windows apps. Selection change is nice because it doesn't matter if it was done by some keyboard combination, uh, mouse click, uh, finger touching a touch screen. It doesn't matter. It changed. Okay, and it'll all fire the same event. So that's a nice centralization for us. And oh, I did throw in a placeholder text here as well. So just to explain that. That will actually get replaced once I populate this with data, but it gives me something to show while I'm waiting for the data to come, right? And I cleverly use the exact same data that I want to show up once it comes from the actual database anyway, right? So that's just to give something there as a placeholder in the top of the drop-down list. So that's stack panel. Uh, Chris is complaining because I don't have all the code in here yet. We'll see it in the big reveal in a moment or two. Okay, the next thing I'm going to put in is an actual list box, right? Now, of course, a list box is really not a very good choice <laughs> for a responsive universal Windows app, but it, it's simple, and uh, I just wanted to keep it simple for our first time through. Don't worry, in part two, we'll look at some better choices, right? The problem with a list box is it's great for a nice vertical list, but if you have this running on a full width, you know, picture it on your 65-inch uh, TV down in the rec room that you have a computer hooked up to, you'll still just get a teeny weeny list down the left side of the screen, right? <laughs> Not very good. But, you know, on a mobile device, it's perfect. Right? Away you go. So we'll, we'll see how we can improve that. But it's nice and simple to start with a list. We have a list box. Again, giving it a name so I can modify things easily in code. Now it's going in grid row one of my child grid. And away we go. Now with a list box, you also have an item template. So we can have a template for each item and how we want to arrange it. Sometimes you might have, you know, like a picture of a book, right? You might have a picture of the cover of the book and ISBN information beside it. Or you might decide to arrange it so things are above and below each other. Right? That's your template. It's how each item is presented. There might be graphics involved or not. Away you go, right? But here's the powerful thing. Each uh, list item in the item template, we're going to define using a data template. So here's our first real binding expression in the XAML itself. So I'm using uh, data type here of the data template is my, oh, there's my namespace. If I called it Fred, I would put Fred here, but data, that's my namespace, employee. So that lets it know that that's the kind of object we're going to be binding each list item to. Each list item actually is an employee, whether we choose to show all its properties in the data template or not. Right? You've already seen, I think, uh, lesson 17 in our tutorial, he showed how to use drop combo boxes and so on, and basically every list item is an actual object. Right? So you usually cast it to an object when you want to pull the data out of a list item. Okay, so we're defining the class for the list items data type. And then we just have a couple text boxes. Notice that I'm using xbind here because I know what kind of an object it is. 
And also notice I'm just using summary properties. Hey, it's a read-only list, right? So why not take advantage of the concatenated version of the name? The position, if you remember how we wrote this particular class, is a combination of the job title, I think a comma space, and the name of the department, right? Which, of course, we're able to get because we have loaded all the departments actually in as objects, right? So that gives us the ability to show all that nicely as the position, as a summary property. So that's what we're going to show inside uh, each list item, and away we go. All right, I think I have an extra couple grids here because it probably fixed them for me at one point when I was violating uh, how it wants to write the code. Okay. Sorry, just a little copy-paste boo-boo there or controls that undo error. So now we have it all together, right? You can see the picture over here. We basically have our combo box. This is the list box down here where we eventually will hopefully show data if we get it from our web API and away we go. Now, there's some code missing, right? We have to add some stuff to the code behind. If I try to do a build right now, I'll get some build errors. Okay. There's no selection changed event, right? I guess that's the only actual build error I have at the moment. So to fix that, here's my selection changed, right? Uh, notice if I hit the lightning bolt, come down here, it says, well, this is defined, but it actually haven't written it in the code yet. I can just double click. That's one way to have it actually create the stub for the uh, event itself. So in the page behind now, there's my selection changed event. I'll program that in a few minutes. But let's start from scratch in terms of the code behind of what we want to do. Right? So we have in the display, we have our drop down list for departments and our list where we're going to show the employee information potentially filled. Uh, by department, right? So, anticipating that, planning ahead, okay, I probably want to call a method, right? Instead of trying to do it all in one big long <laughs> uh, uh, chunk of code, I'll break it up, right? So, I'll, I might at different points want to call something to fill my drop down list with data. So, that's what I would normally do is I would try to organize myself at least a little bit and I'll create a little method here. I'm going to call it fill dropdown, right? And it has the code to go and get the actual departments and bind it to the actual uh, combo box. So a few usings missing. Okay, using my .dal namespace, that's where my repository is. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate a repository object, right? I think I have a typo here. D E P A R T. That one's right. Oh, yeah, so I did have a typo. Okay, now for department, again, control period, add the using for my models folder. There we go. Now it's happier. So just looking at the code and thinking about it for a moment, we'll just create a repository object for departments, right? I'll just call it dot get departments. Notice I have to use a wait because it's a asynchronous operation, but it will, when it's done, return my list of departments. So I'll create that as a list of department objects, just calling it departments as we often do. Now this bit of code here, I'm doing for my own purpose, right? We're taking advantage of the fact that, hey, all we have here is a simple list. We've done lots of work with lists of objects before. I can just add my own object to the list as long as it matches, it's the same type, right? So that's all I'm doing is I just go my departments.add a new department. So this is my artificially created then all option, right? Notice I'm setting the department ID, the value to zero. I'm safe doing that because we know in the database it's an integer identity. <laughs> It'll never create zero, kind of the same trick that we did way back in Prog 1198, right? So I'll make it zero and department name is all departments. Notice that I cleverly, <laughs> cleverly put a space in front of the dash because I know space will come alphabetically before any actual name of a department because those would have not have spaces around them. Which is why my simple dot order by here, my link query, when I assign the actual item source, 
for my combo box, I can put it in alphabetical order with a link query, just doing order by. And that uh, bubbles my artificially created all option right to the top on the drop down list. Simple, right? Nice and easy. Okay. I think because we have this in place, we should actually, well, I've got to put somewhere in code to call this. <laughs> so maybe I'll call it right up here. Fill, drop down. There we go. So let's try running this on the local machine here. And I'm just going to minimize this, get it out of the way. It's not there yet. It's not finished cooking. I've noticed with the uh, Web API up in Azure, the first time you hit it, it seems to have to take a moment to spin up. There we go. Next time, it'll be much faster. Okay, But there's my all option that I added artificially, and then I have the actual list of departments. So yes, I actually am talking to the database. Right? Able to change my selection. Of course, there's nothing in that code yet to do anything, and I haven't written any code to actually populate the list yet either. But we're doing good. Okay, we have some uh, data coming from the web API and showing in our combo box. All right. So the next bit of code I might write is something similar to my fill employee, uh, fill departments, or fill dropdown for departments. Write code to actually then show the employees. Okay, so I could put it above or below. I think I'll put it above, keep it high on the screen. So here my show employees code. Okay, notice I have a nullable int. So if I don't want to filter by a department, I don't have to pass anything. I can just leave it as null or pass null, right? So I same idea. I create an employee repository object, right? Prepare a list to receive the employees. And then, okay, if I actually have a department to filter by, then I'll call get employees by department, passing the department ID. If I don't, then I call a different method right, of my repository. I just call get employees. Right? So I'm either going to get employees by department if I have a department to filter by, or just give me all the employees. And at the end, whichever one I did, I'll just grab that collection of employees and assign it as the item source for the list. Remember, employee list was the name I gave to the uh, list itself. Okay, So that should do the job of uh, getting the data. Now, where am I going to call this? A uh, couple spots. Uh, I should probably call it in. If you do it too early in the uh, page loaded, sometimes I, I'm sorry, in the initialize, uh, the constructor, I sometimes find that can cause some problems. So I'll usually use something like the page loaded event, right? So I'll call show employees there, passing null, because I don't want to filter at first. When the data first loads, I want to see everybody, right? And then the other thing would be to use my event down here that we started off with, my selection changed event for the combo. So when I pick a department, okay, I want to go back and ask for that filtered list. So that's two lines of code. Okay. So remember, show employees, we're expecting a department ID, right? So what I have to do with a combo box, several of you people use this approach with your BMI calculators to pull value out of a drop down or a combo box, right? I grab the selected item. It is an actual department, so I cast it as a department object. Storing it here in selected department, then I can just pull its department ID and pass that to my show employee. And that's it. That's all the code we should need, I believe, uh, to have a working universal Windows app, allowing us to see the employees and filter data for them as well. And I'll make it full screen just for the fun of it. Now, it's taking a moment or two to get the employees at the first request. Oh, may, it might have been something wrong with my page loaded. I'll have to check that again. As soon as I asked for a department, it immediately came up. If I go back to all departments, right, you can see I've got quite a long list of employees here. So obviously some improvements needed to make this a more responsive design. <laughs> 
uh, something that would allow us to maybe show like cards for each employee spreading across the screen, something like that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's basically it there. Um,